Hello and welcome back to another video with It's Dr. Dan and today we're going to be exploring the different properties of molecular compounds, specifically looking at how intermolecular forces affect them. So in this video, the whole idea of what we're going to be trying to try to keep in mind is intermolecular forces are all about attraction, meaning that all these different covalent molecules, they have different electronegativity that's assigned to every single atom. So when we have a polar bond, uh, we want it, that helps us be able to recognize, do we have a polar molecule, which is really important. So it's, I would recommend it's really important to try to memorize some of these little trends for yourself, where if something is nonpolar, typically it's something bound to the same element. So like your diatomic molecules or something like CH bound together. So in organic chemistry, typically when we see carbon to carbon, carbon to hydrogen, these are nonpolar. Now, when we are looking for polar interactions, typically what we look for is everything that's in like the top right part of the periodic table. So stuff like oxygen, nitrogen, fluorine, chlorine. If you see any of those atoms that are bound to, let's say, carbon, typically they are considered to be electronegative, meaning that most likely they are polar. Now, this isn't all the time, right? Those are polar bonds, but that differs from a polar molecule. So when we talk about polar, well, molecules are polar when bonds work together, meaning that essentially, if you can kind of imagine it's like a tug of war, there are going to be more electrons kind of piled on, let's say, one side of a molecule versus another. So if I were to look at like nonpolar molecules, typically what happens is you have the, the different pooling is canceling out. So if I have like a linear molecule where if you imagine you're playing tug of war against your twin and you're both pulling in opposite directions. So here we have a B, the B element on both sides is both pulling. It's going to cancel out. Now, these are typically what we refer to as our basic geometries. So things like trigonal planar, tetrahedral. If it's the same element on all the different positions connected around the central atom, they will all cancel out. And that's stuff that we've learned in previous videos. Can it cancel? That's the most important part. Um, so generally, we always see that nonpolar, they have to all be symmetric and the same atom. So those are very important. Same atom and symmetric. Say that, just say that again, right? So in order for it to be polar, there has to be some kind of net dipole across the molecule meaning that we have an uneven sharing of electrons within it. So if I have a lone pair, this is generally a really good way to see that we have this uneven nature. Lone pairs are very electronegative. So you'll see that all of it is more gauged in one area. So it's bent in trigonal or middle. So if you see a lone pair, generally it's considered to be polar. Now, is that the only picture that we see? Well, when it comes to symmetry, so when an atom is not symmetric, it is always polar. So keep that in mind. So here I have a linear example where we see the same atom again, right? Both pulling in opposite directions. So this is nonpolar. The second I replace one of them with a different atom where it's different, it could be more on one side or the other. It's unbalanced, which is the important thing that we're trying to visualize here. So when we have this uneven sharing that's here, this is when we create a dipole that we can see within the molecule. So we have the delta negative, the delta plus, and what they're going to be doing with one another is if you have multiple molecules of the similar type, so polar and polar, they will attract each other. So when this happens, the properties of different compounds will change. So this is how we can make homogeneous mixtures uh, from this um, this complete mixing. So this is where like dissolves like this phrase that I've used before comes into play. Nonpolar do not mix with polar and vice versa. They need to be the same type of property. So we're going to take a look at this. We're going to try to understand what this whole entire polar molecule idea is all about. So that way we can kind of better understand exactly what this thing looks like. So in this video, we're going to be really focusing on intermolecular forces, meaning that when we have this attraction between either polar compounds, so polar and polar, or nonpolar and nonpolar, they will be attracted. So now keep in mind, these are not actual 
bonds that are forming. It's an attraction. So the analogy I like to use for this all the time is think of it as it's kind of like your family versus your friends. Intermolecular forces are like your friends. You hang out with them. You talk to them. You text them on a regular basis. You can come, you, you hang out with them all the time. However, eventually you both go home to your own houses. Bonding like covalent ionic is like your family. You're related through blood. You probably live together. You're together all the time outside of your normal life. So bonds hold together molecules. They are very, very difficult to break, which is really important. Intermolecular forces are considered weaker, but and they can be broken very easily, but they do affect the chemistry quite a bit. Now, where exactly does that play? Well, it has to do with trying to see, uh, thinking of gases, liquids, and solids. So when you have all these different substances, depending on how strong the force is, it's going to play a massive role in how these things can fall apart how they can actually be seen. So here I have a video that's being shown, and this is one that we can actually get an idea of this. So looking at the overall picture here, we have two molecules that are being heated up. One's on the right-hand side, one's on the left. The left is a strong intermolecular force, which you see the temperatures going up really quickly for both. On the right-hand side, we have a very weak force, so nonpolar versus polar molecules. Now, as they're heating, you'll see that it takes a lot of heat for the polar molecules to eventually break apart and to fall apart. Whereas nonpolar, you heat it up, you still see it's still in the negative degrees before it goes from a solid to a liquid to a gas. So it takes more energy, more heat to actually break apart all these molecules that go from a solid to a liquid to a gas. And this has to do with the intermolecular forces. On the left, I have water, which is hydrogen bonding. On the right, I have oxygen gas, which is dispersion forces. There's a massive difference between these two different forces and how they actually interact, right? So hydrogen bonding is a very strong force. It takes a lot of time before it can actually break apart into the gas phase. So typically things that have very strong interactions is what when we find uh, that they are typically as a solid versus, let's say, if I have a liquid, for example. Solids and liquids have strong interactions, whereas gases typically are very, very weak. Um, and it's kind of like the idea, it's, it's very difficult for them to want to leave those phases. They want to interact with their friends. They want to stay around with them. So we're going to take a look at this world and try to get an idea of how we can actually understand the different types of intermolecular forces. We're looking at the four different types of intermolecular forces, the one thing we have to realize is what exactly are they? So we have ion dipole, hydrogen bonding, uh, dipole dipole, and dispersion forces. Now, when we are looking at each of these, well, we go from strongest to weakest. So let's first start off with ion dipole forces. So ion dipole, what that's all about is that this is an electrostatic force between an ion and a polar molecule. So when we have something like this, well, where exactly can we find them? This is whenever, like I said, you have that ionic compound mixing with a polar molecule. So whenever this is happening, it's generally whenever we try to throw, let's say, a ionic compound like in water, for example, and what it's going to do is the water is going to completely surround it and rip it apart into its ions. So like, for example, we throw salt in water. You can taste that salty taste. What you're tasting is Na plus and Cl minus the ions that are interacting with your taste buds. So this is actually an example of how that works. Now, this is your strongest force because it can actually destroy an ionic bond. Now, hydrogen bonding, on the other hand, is whenever you have hydrogen and it's covalently bound to oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine. It has to be bound to one of those. So whenever we have that interaction, it is interacting with another polar atom when it occurs. So we always have HF, HO, HN when the hydrogen interacts with a electronegative atom. So let's say if I have like H2O and NH3, they can hydrogen bond with one another. There has to be a polar atom, and then one of them has to have a hydrogen on it. And it has to be directly connected to oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine. 
dipole dipole on the other hand is whenever you have a positive and a negative end for your polar molecule meaning that it's op you know opposites attract so whenever we are trying to show that we always have the two poles and we'll draw little dots to illustrate that we have that intermolecular force of them actually talking to each other so this is whenever we have polar molecules when this is occurring we have the negative end interacting with the positive end and just to kind of to finish our little mini review of all these forces dispersion which is the last one this is a temporary attraction and this is going to be the focus a huge focus of this video is how whenever we have dispersion this is a temporary shift of interaction meaning that the electron cloud that's around these molecules will move it will it will change it will alter and now when that does this can happen in all molecules this can occur in however this is the only force and the strongest one for nonpolar but keep in mind everything does it but it's the strongest force for nonpolar so when we are looking at all these right and say all molecules right we want to go from like right to left when it comes to the strength so dispersion is your weakest ion dipole is your strongest force and it has to do with how more how much polar how much more polar can you possibly be when you're trying to look at all these different forces so with the four intermolecular forces the thing that you're really going to see that sets them all apart by looking at them all is the fact that when you are going from one to another is that it's the word dipole that makes them different dispersion forces are nonpolar meaning they do not have a net dipole essentially it's been canceled out right due to the geometry now with dipole dipole hydrogen bonding ion dipole they have that unevenness between from the electron cloud so when that occurs they can interact with one another to create all these different forces and change their properties and our understanding of them so, and that's what we're going to look into is in part two we're going to understand how dispersion forces and polarizability can affect how these things can interact with each other and how it has an, has a, an effect on like things like melting point boiling point and all these other different forces let's take a look in our future video